you see that if you if you can see it and it looks okay put a one in the chat i'm going to put the link of our um going to put a link of our thing here so this is our launching web page here so everybody can get on the same page now i have been hard pressed for time a little bit i know that you've heard me say that before and that's not unusual um but it has bumped up a notch and uh, i haven't quite had enough time to um update the web page like i wanted to but let me show you where i've gotten to in just a moment i'm going to start my own recording i'm going to try to do that although i do appreciate juliana or or uh, i think it was probably you because you're so diligent at doing these recordings so thank you and so we'll keep both recordings going for the time being so let's have a look here uh, at where we're up to i'm going to click on the herrig link thank you juliana and uh, we're here and if we scroll um, up a bit i have updated the boot camp and i have now linked the um, youtube video from last week and um, i can't remember if this was my version or juliana's version but juliana's version is also linked in the in the chat uh, in our team space um, i seem to have um, lost the the recording for 1.5 but here's what we're doing today we're carrying on with the boot camp um, we have the same setup so we all should be used to that and what i'm going to try to accomplish here is to blast through the um through the um lecture a little bit faster than i usually do i'm going to try to restrain myself and then i want to test out um going into breakout rooms to do the coding part one of the reasons i want to do it is a selfish reason because i want to test the breakout rooms for the boot camp for the big class but also i think it is something that might be useful in here um, and be just before we do that i'm going to um, go to the boot camp page and show you that so you all know what this looks like and i'm just going to drop the link for the boot camp page that we're on into the chat so this is the boot camp page we're on. Any um, declarations or comments or questions before we begin? If there is, feel free to uh, turn off your mic and just yell it or put something in the chat. I'll, um, with this setup, it, it allows me to uh, view the chat and interact uh, in a way I prefer with Teams. So um, I'm just going to launch the um, link over here which is the html slides as usual and i'm going to make the slides a little bit nicer and set it to my my slides um figure here i think that looks okay maybe i'll keep it like that all right so it's the boot camp 2.2 just as usual Tonight we're going to talk about um, sampling and distributions. This is one of those things that is uh, ubiquitous in in the practice of statistical analysis. But it's also one of those things I find that um, we tend to encounter it on the first lecture or the second lecture of a uh, first statistics class. And you know how I think of that first statistics class. We say it with air quotes because it's just a, a, a fast blast with, at a very low depth through basic statistics. And sampling and distributions is one of those topics that's always covered in first statistics class, but it's covered very shallowly. And we're just going to shallowly cover it here, but I'm going to give you um, the way that I think about it and why, why uh, uh, just the most important things in my opinion. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is the normal distribution and you know uh, i've said it many times in these meetings that uh, we don't like that that way of calling it we don't like to call it the normal distribution we like to call it the gaussian distribution uh, but actually um, the frequency distribution was first introduced as a statistical tool by by this this fellow gossett does anybody remember 
why Gossett is notable or 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 does anybody recognize his name? Anybody at all? He um he's a little bit well known in uh in the practice of statistics for inventing the the t test one of those uh, basic tests that we use to compare means and we'll talk about that um, in the next couple of meetings uh, next week or the week after and uh, he was sort of famous because he worked for the um, part of the story of his life is that he was uh, good at math but worked at the guinness brewing company and he was interested in quality control making good beer and but he was uh, he was a mathematician and a scientist there and uh, he developed this way of comparing um, data that he collected and then he he published it he worked with uh, other statisticians who were academic statisticians and he published it but he's also credited with uh, sort of describing the frequency distribution and he did it in biometrica a uh, famous statistics journal and he, he published some of this stuff with the famous R.A. Fisher. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's what we're going to blast through before we try the breakout rooms experiment is uh, we're going to talk about the, um, you know, how we use uh, graphs, the histogram specifically, to, um, to judge and to adjudicate uh, on the shape of data or the distribution of data. Going to introduce the Gaussian. Um, but a couple of other distributions too. One is the Poisson. Um, that's one that that um, is a very common data type. We encounter it a lot. And even though it's got a funny name, uh, it's one that you have to know. It's not optional. It's one that's essential to know. And another one that's essential to know is uh, the binomial. Also, these ideas tend to be uh, kind of vague in our minds until we have to use them. But I think if you're going to take it seriously, re remembering some detail about these three is not too much to ask. And we'll talk just briefly in the lecture. I'll just mention that you can diagnose the distribution. This actually takes some practice um, to uh, to be able to feel good about this, um, in my experience. But in the in the boot camp, we do do some of that practice. And then, of course, there are the practice exercises. We'll see if we can get them to them tonight with the breakout rooms. Now, um, almost the lowest common denominator in your toolbox for understanding any kind of data, I often, you guys, there are a bunch of you in here that I've worked with. You've sat right by me, and, and we've done stuff with your data right at the R console. And you'll notice a lot of times that almost the first graph that I make will be something like this or a similar graph just to understand the shape of the data. And I'm looking for a couple of things when I look at a at a histogram. One, I'm looking at the shape of the data. And two, I'm looking for weird points out on the ends of the data that are uh, either incorrect observations or maybe they are um, there's a skew where the data is different than what we see here. And I've just simulated this data. I've used the set seed function, just um, set it to an arbitrary value, completely random. And uh, I've, I've dumped the data into a variable called cat after I've generated uh, using the R norm function. Now this, this stands for the random normal. I wish I could go back and force them to change that to R gauss or something like that. But this is the uh, function that's used to simulate um, random, random numeric data in from a Gaussian distribution. It's got a couple of arguments that we use. The n is the sample size, so this will create a vector of uh, you'd have made quite a big data set, 10,000 values. I think I tell a story on the web page that this is the um, the mass of domestic cats in kilograms. Okay, so I've made up this imaginary population of um, cats. I've set uh, it to have a mean of four, and I've set it to have a standard deviation of 0 0.5. Again, this is just something I, I made up to simulate the data. 
And if we don't set the um, mean and standard deviation arguments, um, our norm will simulate um, data points uh, based on a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, which is um, a, a standard normal. We call that a standard normal population. OK, so th this is kind of what a histogram looks like. Let's look at the code. Um, I guess before we look at the code, we we just observe about the the um, distribution that the bars on here are counts of observations. And if you look down on the x-axis, the graph is a bit small here, but um, we call the width of each bar on the x-axis a bin. And it's it's literally means uh, like in English what the meaning of a bin is. It's something that you put something else into. And in this case, we're putting values that um, that fall between the extreme values of, of the bins. And a, it's a, a particular characteristic of histograms that the bins must be non-overlapping. I know that sounds like totally obvious when I just say it out loud like that, but computationally behind the scenes, the passive aggressive butler in R who's doing the work for us is uh, has set the bin values for us arbitrarily. Now, you can also set that with arguments in the hist function. But uh, an example of the values might be if you had uh, values that were measured to the nearest one tenth, um, one bin might be um, from from uh, from 3.0 to 3.9 exactly and the next one non-overlapping starts at 4.0 up to 4.9 and so forth and here the the bins uh, looks like one two three four five um, bins between whole integers so uh, you know we have an idea of how wide the bins are non-overlapping bins now the shape that we're looking for here is diagnostic <clears throat> Um, we, and we have to learn what the shapes look like. Um, we have a couple of tools that we go through on the boot camp page to diagnose it. Now, uh, well, one of the first things that we think about when we're diagnosing the distribution, uh, even, even before we see a, um, a graph of it, is uh, we think of what we, what we, um, what distribution we imagine the data might fit. This also takes a bit of practice, but for these three, um, I think that uh, they're pretty easy and it's not too much to ask to commit these to memory. So we can always make a judgment on at least these three. So uh, for a Gaussian distribution, the attributes of data that that we would imagine and predict would fit the Gaussian, they're things that you can measure. And uh, I said it in kind of a specific way here things that you measure with continuous precision or infinite precision. So these are things that you measure like human height, the weight of a cat, the length of a piece of string, and so on. Now the Gaussian, uh, as I mentioned, is sometimes called the normal distribution. And literally the reason that I don't accept that, I reject that, is because it implies that the Gaussian distribution is typical, but but it isn't typical. And so I think that's a bad habit to get into. And it is actually a point of confusion for um, for students in teaching and learning. Uh, it 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 is possibly you could argue argue typical for for a measure that um, something that you can measure with infinite precision, but for other kinds of data, it's not typical at all. OK, so um, with all these distributions, we can summarize them mathematically with parameters. And uh, the Gaussian parameters are the mean and the standard deviation. So if we if we make some data, got a little bit of toy data here, and we combine them and chuck them into a um, numerical vector data object, my there. Uh, we can calculate the mean. I haven't shown the equations here, but this is you know really pretty basic stuff uh, and I do show the equation on the on the page but it's basically the sum total of all of the numbers in a vector divided by the number of elements in the vector or the length of the vector so programmatically we could calculate the mean of of our little data variable this way 
uh, the hard way. It's not that hard, but we'll call it the hard way. Uh, and we get 4.7, or we could do it the easy way using a function that does the work for us. And the function, one of the functions that calculates the mean in R, as you probably know, is the mean function. Standard deviation is a little bit trickier. Um, even though it's quite easy to calculate this parameter and there is a um, there is a simple equation programmatically in R, it looks like this where we take the um, the the mean of some variable and we we measure how different each observation is to the mean. So this is a vector of values and this is a single value. So it takes that vector and it it measures the difference between every observation and the vector from that single mean. Then we have a vector of differences and it squares those values. And so that's the um, the squared differences. And then we take the sum of that. And you know that phrase, the sum of squares? This is the sum of squares. There's nothing more to it than that. And for um, we make the distinction in statistics. This is one of the real higgledy piggledy things about it um, that we also always encounter in a first statistics class and almost promptly forget it. But uh, one of the technical details about taking a sample versus um, estimating an entire population, we can never actually in practice measure the entire population that we might be interested in, like, like all the domestic cats in the world. We could never measure that. Um, but instead we take our sample and uh, we correct the the variation, our estimate of the population standard deviation with um, by, by adjusting the number of observations in our sample uh, by one less than the sample size. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of that, but that's basically how it is. Um, and we get a, um, a variance measure first. So this is the sum of squares divided by the sample size minus one. Uh, we can also just calculate that with the var function. And then uh, to come up with the standard deviation, it's the square root of the variance. So uh, we can measure it the hard way like that. And there is the SD function also that measures it directly. But really, let's just commit this one um, to memory. This is review for everybody. The shape of the Gaussian is the bell curve. And um, whether it's wide or tall depends on the values of the two Gaussian parameters, the mean and in parentheses, the standard deviation. So the tall thin value has a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of one. The goldenrod one has a standard deviation of two, but the, the highest density is still centered on the mean. And the green, has the widest, flattest curve with a standard deviation of three. So these three together show the effect of the standard deviation. And then I have this red one out here to the left with a mean of seven and a standard deviation of two. So it's got the same spread as the goldenrod one, it just shifts the mean. So that's how that works. That should all be um, pretty familiar to you. Poisson is a little bit different, Poisson. So this um, story goes, I think I have told the story in, in Herrig meetings in the past, but um, it's the count. The Poisson distribution is typical of data that are the counts of rare events. Okay, so where we we would go out and count some, some event that happens, and uh, typically it would be an event that doesn't happen very, very often. Okay, so there are a couple of, of examples. One, one historical example of this would be something like the uh, number of deaths from being kicked by a horse in the Prussian army. It's a strange example, you might say, but um, it actually is the example and the data set that was used to describe the Poisson distribution. And it was um, humbly described by Monsieur Poisson. He named it after himself. Uh, he studied this phenomenon in the Prussian army and published the paper a long time ago. But I digress. What the Poisson distribution uh, is, is uh, characterized by, is that it, it usually has a low mean value. 
And that, I mean, I, that's another way of saying that it, it's the counts of rare events. Um, and the Poisson parameter is a single parameter. And um, does anyone does anyone know the English word for this character? Does anyone know the English word for this character? Could you just put it in the chat if you know the English word for this character? It's just a little quiz. Just a, a micro flash quiz. Does anyone know? Yes, it's the lambda. Well done. So the uh, the lambda, it's excellent. We all know the lambda. Excellent. This is very good. The the lambda is the is the traditional symbol for the Poisson parameter, and it, it represents both the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, so in other words, if if a um, if a variable adheres to the Poisson, um, it its standard deviation is equal to its mean, or pretty close. For a sample, we would allow for a little sampling error. So uh, on the boot camp, I. I explained that I have um, simulated some data. I've uh, used the set seed function to simulate the data, and I've set the seed to an arbitrary value. And here I've made the um, the data with the rpoise function. It's a random Poisson variable. So I've simulated this. I'm drawing a hundred observations, and I've set the lambda, the Poisson parameter, to three. The story that I tell is that this is the count of U's with triplets. It's a rare event. So in any year, you might count how many U's have triplets. All right, so um, let's make a histogram. I've um, set the histogram um, data parameter to my pause, the vector of, of values that I simulated. I've, I've gone ahead and set the um, a title with a main argument and the X label with the X lab argument. OK, so this is kind of what a Poisson distribution looks like. Um, the mean of this sample should be around three. Kind of a weird thing to keep in mind if you do simulation like this is that when we when we simulate data, when we set the lambda to three for a Poisson distribution that is we're, we're setting the um, theoretical population mean to three and then we're randomly drawing a sample um, to simulate a sample drawn from that real population mean of three so our real population uh, i mean our real sample mean will be near three most likely but it won't necessarily be exactly three in fact it's unlikely to be exactly three because of sampling error um, now, this this histogram is characteristic of the Poisson. The Poisson is, remember, it's a count of something, so it's truncated at zero. We can't have any negative values. That's one characteristic. Another characteristic is that uh, it tends to have a, a lower frequency of values near zero than it does um, near the mean, and the mean, because it's a rare event, is is uh, not too big, less than 10 usually. And then there tends to be a long right tail or a right skew to the data with a decreasing amount of variable of um, frequency of observations um, as, as you increase along the x-axis. So this is very typical of a Poisson distribution. And um, this is just a little bit of a simulation, just like the that uh, Gaussian simulation that I did that simulates um, samples drawn from three different theoretical Poisson populations. So the golden rod one is um, uh, where the Poisson parameter is set to one. So the mean is uh, around one around here. And uh, the red in the middle, the Poisson parameter is set to about three. So the, the mean is somewhere around here. And we have this characteristic hump and the long tail. Now th I've set this with a, um, notice how this, this one has a mean of three and it has this characteristic hump 
right there, but my my sample over here didn't have that. Um, yet I say this is characteristic for a population with a mean of three and the red is characteristic with a mean of three. Let me explain that. Here, um, my sample is just 100. So due to sampling error, we probably have a few uh, more or a greater frequency of um, low values, just a couple more than, than we would expect um, if we were to measure the, uh, a very, very large population or a much larger sample. And these, just so that they looked pretty and for, you know, to demonstrate the theoretical distribution, these are simulated from a much larger sample size. And then, not surprisingly, when we increase lambda up to five, it uh, flattens out and it shifts the mean. But a thing I want you to notice here is that um, whereas uh, the shape of the distribution for Gaussian just got wider only, but the mean stayed exactly the same, as the um, Poisson parameter changes, both the mean shifts and the shape of the whole distribution and, and indeed the width also does shift. Also notice that this blue um, line, the one with the um, mean of five, it is uh, starting to look a little bit, I mean, it does have a long tail, but it's starting to look a little bit bell-shaped. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you have um, count data that has a large mean, so, um, you know, larger than 10, firmly larger than 10, like uh, 20 or above the uh, indeed the Gaussian I mean uh, the Poisson even if it came from a Poisson population it does tend to um, to start to resemble the Gaussian that's nice to know because um, we make the assumption of Gaussian residuals for regular old linear models as you know for the general linear model like plain old regression plain old analysis of variance and if you have count count data if it has a large mean, your data probably will adhere to the assumptions and we won't have to do Poisson regression. OK, but we'll get on to that later. The last one we want to mention here is the binomial distribution. This one again is very important. Many of you may have already collected binomial um, kind of data. And this one's a funny one because um, the data that are binomial are are flexible. Um, in fact, I, I know a couple of you have collected binomial types of data. Um, so typically, binomial data is one where we're, we're counting the outcome of an event. And it, the classic example for the true binomial, the classic binomial, is when there are exactly two possible outcomes. And there's a little bit of a jargon around um, around the um, description of the binomial distribution. And, and let me introduce just quickly a couple of the little bits of jargon. Like one of them is that um, for a single observation, it's, re it's referred to as, a, um, as, a, as an experiment. A single observation is a single experiment, where as you know, normally we might just call it an observation. But in the binomial world, um, we, we sometimes refer to it as a single experiment. And uh, the outcome of that experiment um, could have one of two outcomes. We're talking about things like, um, like live or die, or, or if we clip, flip the coin, if we did an experiment and one experiment was the flip of a coin, the outcomes might be heads or tails, or it might be um, with disease or healthy. Um, and, you know, you can think of all the different ways that that might work. But um, another final little piece of jargon that we often see is that um, one of the outcomes is sometimes referred to as a success. Uh, this is just a peculiarity and it's, it's almost meaningless to a scientist making an experiment. And yet you come across it frequently enough that I think it's important to be aware of. So this would be an example of like um, you flip a coin and you pick one value that is the success value. And traditionally, the success value would be set to one. If it was um, live or die, maybe we'd set, you know, live to one. 
And this it's important to think of which one is the success because the traditional way of um, of graphing these uh, in the binomial distribution, at least one of the traditional ways, is to graph the probability of of attaining a value of zero or one. So it affects the way you um, visualize the data. Okay, well, um, you know, sometimes we are interested in that probability and sometimes we are interested in the counts of uh, successes or failures. Um, we describe the binomial with, with two parameters, two binomial parameters. One of them is the, uh, the probability of a, of a success in a single experiment or trial. And the second parameter is the number of trials that we do or the number of experiments. We only need to know the probability of success. But you know, there's a, there's a probability of failure too, isn't there? But it's easy. Um, we actually only describe the, the, excuse me, the distribution because of the probability of success because uh, one minus the probability of success is the probability of failure. So being explicit about the probability of failure is it's just redundant. So, um, <clears throat> you know, this is what the, the binomial distribution looks like. Um, we tend to have to be pretty careful with binomial data. Um, let me give you a practical thing is that if somebody is a pretty good statistician and they review your paper and you have not been explicit about analyzing binomial data, um, they'll get straight on it. There are a couple of reasons why reviewers and statisticians are tricky about it. I'm not going to do a full blown uh, analysis of that or even a even a not even really going to begin to other than to say that um, one of the reasons they do is because the distribution is very truncated. You can see that in the goldenrod um, example here. So this is the one where we've done 10 trials and the probability of success is exactly 50%. And what we've graphed here is the number of um, successes. So uh, for, for this, where we've done 10 trials and there's a probability of 50% of success, we would expect um, the highest probability of getting exactly five successes. Okay, that makes a little bit of sense. But look what we can also do. This starts to get pretty interesting. We can also calculate the probability or the density of having exactly four which is roughly equivalent to the probability of having exactly six successes. And likewise, we can go down to the other values too. Look at how the, um, the um, shape of the distribution shifts, where we've got, again, the same number of trials, 10 trials, and but the probability of success is 80%. So it shifts and uh, it's a more acute density for the predicted value of eight and it, it decreases, and look at how it decreases non-symmetrically in this case. So it's another characteristic of the binomial, and it's one of the reasons this asymmetrical distribution of probabilities. I've, I've shown you in a way a false example here because it's a small number of trials where I've got this one is symmetrical and this one is symmetrical and this one's the only one that's not. But as the number of trials changes, um, you get all sorts of crazy possibilities most of which are asymmetrical. And it's that asymmetry that makes it important when you have a binomial variable to, to use the proper um, distribution for the family of statistical error that you're modeling. So we use a logistic regression or a generalized linear model with a binomial error. Okay. Um, and I guess um, I should also say for, the, for some of you guys are new to this, all that stuff sounds really scary, and it, it probably is um, scary, but uh, we, we have covered some of those in the past. So if you look on our old website, there are some lectures on there that cover the generalized linear model, and also the EVA class goes into that in a fair amount of detail, and that'll be starting in a few weeks. All of you are, of course, welcome to sit in and attend. Now, um, the last thing that we do on this bootcamp page is we diagnose the distribution. And um, this takes some practice. Um, this is a bit of a quote uh, 
you know, just like a human doctor diagnosing an ailment, you examine the evidence, consider the other pop possibilities, the alternatives, you judge the context, you know, what kind of data you have, and then you guess about it, just like a doctor does. So that is this, essentially exactly what the statistician does. But we do have a few other tricks in our bag that we will look at. Um, and the tricks that we have to inform our guess is uh, we have some expectation based on the type of data. Now I've gone over these these simple types and there are a few other kinds of distributions that we might encounter and we have talked about some of them in the past in here in Herrig. Um, but if you have these three that I've talked about, the Gaussian, the Poisson, and the binomial, you, you will cover many of the cases you're likely to encounter. We always graph the data and take a look. So we start with that expectation, and then we graph the data. Um, remember with this graphing, this is another thing that I find uh, is kind of difficult until you get used to it. And it's the idea that <clears throat> when we graph a whole variable, if, if, if we've done an experiment and let's say there there is a factor with three treatments or something, a control and two levels of a um, of um, some sort of uh, factor or something, what um, what we will will tend to do is to graph a histogram of the raw dependent variable and then uh, you know kind of try to make a judgment on the distribution but but actually just a little bit of a warning as an aside here that that we don't make an assumption about the distribution of the raw data we make a dis an assumption about the distribution of the residual values so um, we often and a lot of you who have sat and worked with me have seen me do it we'll first perform a linear model and then we'll make a histogram of the residuals to analyze that so then we um, we may do some sort of formal comparison between our residuals or our raw data if it's appropriate and and some expected theoretical distributions so an example of this would be to use a qq plot uh, or to visualize a histogram with a line of a theoretical expectation of density and we go through both of those in the boot camp um, and then Another little tool in the toolbox here is we try transformation. And uh, the idea of this is what if we have a, a skewed variable and we apply a transformation like a square root to squash to squash the values. And uh, we call this coercing the data, coercing it to Gaussian. We almost we're always, the only situation we usually would do this in, transform data like this, would be to uh, to either coerce to the Gaussian, so that we could use a relatively standard, easy to explain and easy to perform and interpret statistical test, or to um, to um, try to try to put different variables that are on different scales, have very different means, for example, and squash the scale down so their their scale is more similar. So those are the two reasons. OK, and that's it um, for now. I want to go back to our uh, page now. We have a little bit more time. I've, I've um, gotten through that in good time, and I'm just going to open up the Herrig page again <clears throat> and uh, navigate back to this page. Again, I can kind of put this in the, um, in the um, page for you. And uh, now what I would like to do is um, I'm going to um, what what I mean for everyone to do with this boot camp. I know you all know this, but to, just to reiterate it, it's been a been a little while since we've been in these regular meetings um, and just coming back to it last week. But um, what I mean for the boot camp, what I mean to happen in the boot camp is to literally read the information and to literally type and run the code yourself. And I uh, have provided you with a script here. So you can download that to a place on your computer, follow along. And I'm just going to bring that up on my own computer in our studio. 
then I'm going to attempt to to break us out in um, breakout rooms. And um, I'll explain that in just a moment. So uh, let's kind of pretend that um, let me get a folder open and drag it over so that you can see it. <clears throat> And you can go ahead and download the file if, um, if you're going to follow along a little bit here. <clears throat> so um, I've just opened up um, Windows Explorer and I've downloaded. Uh, I, let's pretend I downloaded. I haven't downloaded again because I have several copies of this all over my computer. But I'm just going to navigate deep down where I've got this script. And um, the script uh, is there. And I'm just going to open that in RStudio. And switch to my RStudio view. And um, uh, you can even focus in on the script. and. Um, if you kind of look at this, you can see that it, I've got the standard header, I've got the standard table of contents, and and so forth. And I did leave off the um, stuff down at the bottom, uh, which is is the the last part of the the pages, the practice exercises. I'm just going to click down there real quick. And so all I've done down here for the practice exercises is to is to paste in the questions as comments. Um, so what I would like to do is if people would like to follow along, I'm going to attempt to, um, I see Matt's got his hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, just, I, I might have missed something, but I, I went to the link. Um, I'm getting a 404. Oh, uh, let's examine that. Let me do try to explicitly download. That's on the script bootcamp 2.2. Oh. oh, look at that. OK, I know what has happened. I've allowed myself to have. Um, let me just explain it in words and I'll actually show you in real time how to how to fix it. <laughs> um, so what has happened is I've allowed myself to have two different GitHub repositories, one that I've been I've been <laughs> maintaining for um, for the Herrig pages and one that I have been maintaining for the boot camp. And um, so here's how that works. I'm just going to copy the one that's in my my um, site. If I just pull this out, I'll lit literally show you exactly what's happening. I have a GitHub repository that's called um, Git HADS, uh, Harper Adams Data Science. Then I have another Git that is um, for the Data Science Garage. Uh, and actually, I, I do need the Git for the Data Science. Let's see here, pages, and I'm just going to open up the Herrig main page, and, and then I'm just going to look in that main page and see what I'm linking to. <laughs> and I may have just made the wrong link, so it, that this script should be in this folder. So then I'm just going to check that, and I think that we can for Herrig files. Ah. Yeah, so that's the problem. So um, what I need to do is um, do this, do that. Copy and just edit this little link here. Eric files 20 in. Uh, it does look similar, so let's just make sure that no, nope, it's not similar. <laughs> Pages, hair files. OK. So this is what you do every single time. Let me just um, do the preview. So this compiles the page. It's compiled. What that does is it makes a new um, HTML. So it's just made a new HTML. And now, um, here's 
Here's how the magic works. I'm just going to come um, over here, and show you my, my GitHub page. And I see there are no changes. Now, why is that? Why is that? I may not be able to solve it, but uh, what I can do is I can drop the script in the, in the chat. <laughs> I may have to work on that. I'm not sure why it's doing that. My, my live fail um, failed me. There we go. Oh, it won't let me do that. Let me put it in a zip. Send to you. zip. Let's see if it lets me do that. Nope, won't let me drop a file. I think that's the old Teams for you. That's one of the reasons I, I don't like using the Teams. I'm not going to be able to fix it, guys. I'm sorry about that. I'm not going to be able to do it live. I'm going to have to problem solve out of here. Sorry about that. I did that right before we came in, and uh, I, I do have it between the two repositories. I think instead of, uh, we don't have a lot of time, instead of um, trying to do the more ambitious thing that I wanted to do then, we can salvage the last 10 minutes and I'll do live coding like usual. So, um, let's see here. So we've got the script view. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so, um, what the page code aspires to do, uh, and this is just all the, the actual code that runs on the page, is uh, the first part uh, is the use of the histogram, and this is where I simulate the cat data. And I, I recommend bringing up the, the help pages if I just go back out to the whole R Studio. I've just inserted that code for you um, right, right in this code, and I recommend typing it in, just getting in the habit. And this brings up a, a page that's got a family of um, data simulation functions. They're incredibly useful to help you figure out how the world is working. So I'm just going to focus back in on the uh, script for a second. <clears throat> and um, if we just run this to simulate that data, I'll set the seed and um, simulate the cat's data. And then um, I'm just going to run this and I'll, I'll focus down on the console and here it comes. So I'm going to run the cats, just the first 10 values, three, two, one. And we can see that we are getting raw values with a high decimal pre precision. You know, the default, unless you set your R options is six decimals of precision. And uh, I can make a histogram of that if I um, zoom back out for a moment, three, two, one in the plots function. It makes that plots that I made before. So it's the basic use of the hist function. Now um, we can we can um, simulate some some sampling from a bigger population with a couple of functions. And I think the ones that um, that I've done is um, one of the typical kind of tricks that a first statistics class might do is the idea that um, you sample a population and there's sampling error, and uh, to to actually sample to actually measure the error of sampling, we can simulate, do a little simulation experiment to sample and measure how much error we get due to sampling error. And on the page, I go through um, a little experiment like that. And to to do it, I use the sample function, which just um, randomly samples numbers, and you can exploit it to um, sample the uh, addresses, the index values for a vector. And then I also use the vector function to create a vector. We have used that before this one in the boot camp. So um, what I do is I'm going to create a vector that's the mode numeric. So it's going to be a numeric vector and I'm going to make uh, 100 addresses, length 100, in my means, three, two, one. So it pops up here. And by default, when you make a vector, a numeric vector, it makes, um, it populates it all with zeros. So it's all empty. I can just print it down in the um, console, three, two, one, to prove it. And uh, here I've used a for loop. And um, in my, my means vector, the empty one I just created, uh, for 100 loops, 
it will run this code 100 times. What I'm going to do is my, I'm going to sample my um, my cat's data that I simulated up above. Just we can just print all that out as well. Thousand values, so it's actually quite big. Um, I'm just going to sample um, my cat's data, and I'm going to take a random grab of size 30 uh, out of that 1,000 samples. Make that a little subsample. Then um, I'm going to take the mean of my subsample and put it in the vector my means. So if I run that, it'll run um, I in 1 to 100. So this is just the syndex for a for loop in R. So there we go, and it'll pop up um, the the my mean um, will uh, change up in the global environment. You can keep your eye there, and it'll populate with means three, two, one. There we go, <clears throat> and uh, we can just have a look at those means. Why are we not getting that? Let me run it again. I think I've um, think we've got a typo in here. Means oops, gotta do a little bit of um, bit of code hacking here on the fly. I have probably just enough time to figure out what's going on. Let me wrap my head around this. Sample going into my sample, mean my sample. I've made my means up here, so I need to put the same name up there. So I've, I've instigated a vector up here called my means. I've called it empty there, but I, I had misspelled it there. So if I run this again, there we go. And then we can take our sample of samples is there. OK, that's nice because I've found a bug here in this. <clears throat> then what we want to do is we want to make a histogram of the um, of the means. I'm actually going to change this back <laughs> to mean so I don't have to change every other thing in the script. I run it again just to um, just to do that. I'll print it out again. Bam. What does it not like? My mean, my mean, my mean. It says my mean not found. My mean, my mean, my mean. Oh. And I'll I'll remake this up here as well. This will be the last thing I do. There we go. And there's our histogram. So this is a sample of samples of n equals 30 per sample that uh, is an estimate of our of our real population. This is our true population. This is 100 sample small samples out of our true population to estimate our population. It's down to the last five minutes, guys. And uh, because I have this other session right after this one, I'm going to have to uh, end it there. And any comments or questions, I'll fix. I've made a note to myself here. Um, let me just add a little bit of a note to that to make sure I update the R script on the boot camp too to um, upload the, um, the new R script so you can go through that yourself when you want, or you can type it yourself, of course. Upload new script. And I also want to double check the bootcamp um, HTML <laughs> and markdown page to make sure that that um, little typo is not also on that page. I think I remember that vaguely, even though I wrote this like a year ago or a year and a half ago, even. Check HTML 2.2. Any comments or questions? We'll, um, we'll pick it back up next week. We're going to move on to 2.3. Um, I, I may I may try to, uh, I don't know wh whether you would prefer, but the way I see it, we have this hour. We can use it any way we want. I can think of three ways to use it. One way is just do it like we have, where most of the time is me talking and lecturing. That's one way. Another way is we could use none of the time lecturing. I could just upload the lecture and we could spend most of our time doing code and solving those exercises at the end. I've tried to do a mix of both, and I've always failed. We always run out of time. 
So um, think about that, and we can we can make the decision on the fly. But I kind of would like to try to spend more time coding and with other people coding as well. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Thank you. I'm going to stop my my local recording there. We can stop the big recording too if you would like to do that. And uh, I'll see you next week. Bye. <clears throat> bye bye.